If you're gonna build a pyramid, you need a broad base. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it falls over. If you look at what we've got with the finances and distribution, we've got an upside down pyramid. And upside course, down pyramids yeah. definitely fall over. First year of the Premier League, turnover of the Premier League was 45 million. Turnover of the EFL was 34 million. That's a gap of 11 million. Mm. The gap now is 3 billion. I think Rafa would acknowledge, perhaps grudgingly, I think he would acknowledge that with the Moores family, he actually had something quite special. Mm -hmm. And it's a be careful what you wish for. How much responsibility did you think the Premier League should have for a bailout? This is Upfront with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So with this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up to proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way. And more importantly, so might you. In today's episode, we'll be taking you through the corridors of power in a time of important debate for the future of football in this country. We'll assess the arguments around fit and proper club owners, the EFL's future amidst a Goliath Premier League, independent regulation, and we'll dissect potential challenges on the horizon engulfing world football. Who better to explain and much more with a man who was there at the very formation of the Premier League back in 92, a former Liverpool CEO, and now today, the EFL chairman. Rick Perry, welcome to Upfront. Thank you. Rick, I think the most important question straight out of the gate, I think, to set up this conversation is, given what I've just said and your background and your influence over some very significant moments in football, how do you look at the landscape of football full stop at this moment in time? Um, mixture of challenges and opportunities. The game is in pretty good health overall. There are mm -hmm. a huge amount of uh, pluses in front of us. But, you know, again, challenges to be wary of. And, and the, I think the game thrives despite those running it much of the time. Including you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've made more mistakes than most people so over the years so uh it's the resilience of the game and the you know the enduring appeal to the fans that is its greatest strength yeah what do you think in your sort of top down analysis are the biggest challenges that football has the imbalances in distributions in terms of distribution yeah. Uh, you know, as you said, clearly my focus is on what's happening domestically. But you look at what's happening in the world game as yeah. well. Um, you well look between at FIFA and FIFA UEFA. And UEFA yeah. um, you know, FIFA have pretty much handed the um, 2034 World Cup to Saudi, Saudi. Arabia, yeah. despite all the changes to the rules, regulations, the increased transparency. Are you uncomfortable with it? The optics, you know, when, when you kind of give the next World Cup to three continents, so it means the next one has to go to Asia. It, it looks odd, particularly when it just comes out of the blue. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been trailed. Before that, we'll have the Saudis with the Club World Cup. 32 teams in a Club World Cup. I mean, how, how does that work in the middle of mm -hmm. the season? Has mm -hmm. anybody thought about the implications of that? Um, and you kind of hear... The power brokers, you hear Seferin's comments, we're not worried about Saudi. Yeah. Well, really? I mean, well, you should be. It's been echoed by Richard Masters yeah. as well to some extent. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. But take you to the EFL, which is your domain at this moment in time. <clears throat> I mean, I was in the EFL for a lot longer than I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. The irony of the EFL, especially if in the championship, is it's most of the time you want to get out of it yeah, if you've yeah. got any ambition. Yeah. Um, when, you refer, when you first arrived in 2019, what did you inherit? I sat down because, you know, I'd, I'd sort of broken the Football League apart. Why, why would they want me? Mm -hmm. um, I could imagine standing up at the first club meeting and seeing some very frosty uh, reception <laughs> faces. Mm -hmm. But um, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know what? Actually, the FL matters. The clubs matter. Mm -hmm. There's an authenticity. Absolutely. They're at the heart of their towns and their communities. They are the beating heart of their communities. You know, I often say we've got 72 social entrepreneurs who were mm -hmm. in it for the right reasons. Um, so I thought, and and you know what, maybe my experience can help a little bit. Um, and, and maybe we can try and kill a few sacred cows and, mm. and try and bring about some change. Um, 
it wasn't a great place to be at the time. There was a lot of mistrust and ill feeling, and they'd just been through rows over the TV deal, um, okay. which you know it was ever thus with the EFL. Very much so. Yeah. Um, nothing new there. Um, but but I felt it just needed a bit of confidence and a bit of um, let's just be a bit bolder, let's be a bit braver, um, let's look at our strengths and, and build upon the strengths. Um, and as you said, there is a paradox in that the most attractive members of the FL don't want to be there, mm -hmm. which is absolutely understandable. But I think our philosophy was, let's try and pull all 72 together and keep them together and set the purpose right at the start within the FL of making clubs sustainable. Right. Which and I that agree applies with. at the top and the bottom. I agree with that. So yeah. that is a common link between Middlesbrough and Forest Green Rovers. Yeah, yeah. It's all about sustainability, reducing that dependence on, on an individual. funding. Yeah, absolutely right. Which is not to say you want to stifle ambition. It's not to say no. you don't want people to invest. It's that dependence on yeah. owner funding. And if you look at the championship, you know, it's 16 million a club. It's the most expensive lottery ticket on the mm. planet. Mm. It's just, it's insane. Yeah. Um, and so the whole focus was on trying to change that, which has not been easy and we're not there yet by any means but but when you do that then you unite people behind that common purpose and then although there are massive differences um size scale there are a lot of similarities too mm. um and you know the vast majority of the clubs uh, by no means all but the vast majority local ownership you know great people um, doing well, certainly jobs. one. I would say that's probably the case in League One and League Two, but I think probably in the Championship you've got a mixed bag, haven't you? It is mixed, but yeah. you've got Steve Gibson at Middlesbrough, Absolutely. you've got the Coates family, you've got Steve Lansdowne at you've Bristol got City. the Hemmings yeah. family at yeah. um, Preston. So, you know, you've still got that yeah. running through. One of the things I always used to really get quite irritated with was this EFL was this this seeming tacit acceptance to be the runt of the litter, to be the second-class citizen, mm -hmm. even from the deals that were done with the broadcasters. And I don't mean trying to pair in and piggyback on the Premier League deals. I mean that the representation, it used to irritate me intensely, that the Premier League's uh, sort of uh, lead-up to a match was bells and whistles and stars. Ours was an old geezer with a rattle <laughs> in the EFL. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that this, there was this sort of limited ambition and limited outlook. And I'd sit in EFL meetings. And in, in the end, Rick... I would stop going. That all 72 clubs had a vote. Mm -hmm. And so you'd be getting, as a championship club that had very different requirements, you'd be getting outvoted in significant issues by other clubs with different dimensions, like, like the solidarity payments that were offered in exchange for the EPP deal that was put through when the clubs gave up their compensation rights for a small amount of cash because the clubs in League One and League Two needed that cash and the championship clubs didn't. Do you still have that battleground? Uh, we might, but we don't at the moment because, as I said, the thing we've really tried to focus on is is keeping all the 72 together. Mm -hmm. The thing we've done best, single thing we've done best, I think is achieving that. The board works really well. We don't have splits. We don't have divisional splits on the board. We We don't have, well, we haven't had any divisional splits in meetings. So... You know, classic example when we were trying to get money out of the Premier League for COVID yep. and the government was pushing them. Yep. And they gave 30 million initially to Leagues One and Leagues Two. They did, yeah. Yeah. And nothing to the Championship. Yep. Leagues One and Leagues Two said, that's not fair. They didn't grab the money and say, well, did we'll they? have that. They actually said, we are a League of 72 and we have to do what's right for everybody. And that was pretty commendable. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the way we absolutely try to operate will will we do it on every single issue who knows mm. um but, but if we, you start that culture you might have a little bit of opportunity to continue it in yeah, test, yeah in testing moments yeah. absolutely and that's that is for me absolutely front and center of what we need to try to do that is the very strength of the efl because you know and we do want people rising falling up and down the pyramid mm. you know the the luton's a brilliant story because luton kind of sum up the pyramid. Back in 91, when we were just getting the Premier League underway, Luton were in the old first division. They mm -hmm. voted 
on the founder members agreement. They were a signatory to the founder members agreement. So they were very much a part of making the Premier League happen. Didn't play in it, got relegated. Lengthy period in the National League, mm. straight back up and into the Premier yep. League. I mean, that's... Football is finest. You know, that's what English football should be yeah, yeah. about. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, because do you hold the view, because I do, that the Premier League was spawned out of the uniqueness of the English pyramid? Now, it may not be because of it, or in terms of it, it's, it's, it's moved off in a little island, but without the whole fabric of English football, there's a reason that the Premier League and English football is revered the way it is. And it isn't just because it's got 20 clubs in the Premier League, but the uniqueness of the English pyramid system, the uniqueness of our cups, the iconography <laughs> of our national stadium, all of, all of these, all of these are pivotal parts of what sums up English football and what creates the Premier League. Do you do you concur with that view, or do you say no, no, no? The Premier League is a phenomenon, and the the, the English Football League is what it is. No, I completely agree with that. And you know, it, if you're going to build a pyramid, you need a broad base, mm -hmm. otherwise it falls over. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what we've got with the finances and distribution, we've got an upside down pyramid. An upside down pyramid yeah. definitely fall over. So, yeah, hundred percent agree with all the strengths of the. English game and you know if you look at attendances in League Two at the moment well within the top 10 leagues in Europe which Absolutely. is pretty astonishing we've got Bradford getting 20,000 plus we've got Stockport we've got Wrexham getting 10,000 plus I mean attendances at the highest since the 1960s it's um, you know it th there are some really positive signs from top to bottom but it and but it matters so much that as I said those clubs are very much the beating heart of their communities um, it, within the smaller towns across north of England. So, listen, every Premier League club does brilliant stuff for its communities, and some of them have worldwide communities, yeah. and I'm not decrying the Premier League in any way, shape, or form. But the impact of Accrington, Stanley, within Accrington, yeah. arguably is bigger than the impact of Manchester United within Manchester. Uh, yeah. A moment ago, you talked about the Premier League and the beginning of the Premier League. And of course, you were an instrumental figure in there. Obviously, there was a will inside football for change. There was a need inside football for change. The ITB deal deals that had been done before weren't producing huge amounts of revenue. Football was in a very strange position in terms of its societal positioning because we had the hooliganism elements. And then there's you. You were brought in as one of the architects of the construction of the Premier League. Take people through how that manifests itself, how that, that, that breaking of eggs made an omelette. Well, it was a really exciting time. Um, and it happened unbelievably quickly. Right. Um, and the key to it was momentum. And mm -hmm. it was a creature initially of the big five. Yeah. Being uh, who at that time? I think Everton were in that mix, weren't they? Because Yeah, Carson Everton, so Tottenham. Who would, have, who would have been the big five there? Spurs, Everton, Tottenham. Liverpool. Arsenal, Liverpool, Man United. And you, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's been well documented. They they were the big five who'd favoured ITV back yep. in 88. David Dean, yeah. The irony of how I became involved, this is an insane story. I'd been running Manchester's bid for the Olympic Games. Right. And I'd seen quite a lot of Graham Kelly because we were bringing VIP guests to Wembley and we were talking about new national stadium. Um, Graham was chief executive of the FA then. Um, and we'd lost out the bid for Manchester. It, I mean, you can't have more fun than bidding for the Olympic Games in a job. It was unbelievable. But I had to think, am I going to do that again? And Manchester will probably lose again. Or do I do something different? Um, and... That was a big decision. Do I go with the heart? Do I go with the head? And a friend of mine who'd just been made redundant gave me a book called What Colour Is My Parachute? Um, where you fill in all sorts of charts and work out what your ideal job is. Mm -hmm. um, and being a massive football fan, I'd filled in all these charts, looked at all the stuff I'd done in my career, stuff I really enjoyed. And you kind of turn the handle and look at what the output is and it says your ideal job would be running a football league I thought, well that's ridiculous that's not <laughs> happening chucked all the papers away and the following week graham kelly phoned and said i know you've finished olympic bidding little project you might be interested in um can we meet mm -hmm. 
but it's top secret. And Graham said, look, the big five have been to see me. Ironically, the FA might be receptive. Mm -hmm. We would never have been normally. And again, this is, this is entirely true that in the summer of 92, the Football League had prosecuted Swindon Town for financial irregularities. They'd just been promoted from second division to the first division. Uh, first time ever, which was massive for them. But the league discovered financial irregularities, had a disciplinary commission, demoted them to the third division. Swindon appealed to the FA, which was a process in those days. Mm -hmm. So England have just reached the semi-final of the World Cup. Of the World Cup. Mm -hmm. So they take the entire council out to watch the World Cup semi-final, right. apart from three who were either too old or too infirm to travel. They formed the appeal committee for Swindon. <laughs> Sounds about right. Totally misunderstood the case. Yep. Sounds about right. And demoted them from the first division to the second division, which is where they were in the first place. FA didn't have a clue what to do. They knew they probably ought to react, but they couldn't think how. And then suddenly the big five approached them to mm -hmm. say, we're thinking about a breakaway. So Graham says, that's interesting because our relations with the Football League are at a pretty low ebb. Mm -hmm. I quite enjoy doing this talk at business schools where people do strategy and planning mm -hmm. and thinking about things and he said well the biggest change in england football didn't come about as a result of a strategic plan it was this coincidence of mm -hmm. interests the big series five of unintended wanting consequences, to yeah. break away because of tv dealings the fa suddenly at a low ebb with the football league and that amazing coincidence of, so that's how it all mm -hmm. happened and graham approached me to say look i've told the big five that when you look at what happened in the 80s there was talk about breakaways it hadn't been thought through nobody knew what the plan was so i've said to them approach us with a proper plan yeah and advise them to hire you mm -hmm. and so i got hired to help put the plan together right and the rest is downhill from there i guess <laughs> Don't know about that did you have any meaningful resistance from any significant clubs in terms of the 22 clubs that were brought to the table <coughs> by the uh, by the by the genesis of a thought process from five big clubs and the FA's involvement, or or was there just a general accord? This is the moment. This is the opportunity. If the momentum is here, let's take it. There was a really strong accord. Um, th there there was a lot of hostility to the big five. Yep, that's what I, I mean. It point, was yeah. extraordinary, but at the same time, people were pragmatic and realised we actually do need yep. them. Uh, because they do drive audiences yep. and yep. we do... That's the commercial reality of it. Yep. We do understand that. But, and you have to respect the big five, in a sense, for compromising at that stage. As I said, the messages that came to me from the other 17 were, we'll go for this, but only, only if we don't repeat the mistakes that we got in the Football right. League. So no TV subcommittees. Yeah. Independent board. Transparency. Uh absolute simplicity of voting the antithesis of what the football league was and they said if we can achieve that yes we will go along with it and the first manifestation of that to show that it was real was of course the vote on the sky deal yeah when the big five were outvoted right because their plan was itv was to have itv yeah yeah uh, and i bore the brunt of their, their wrath, yeah. wrath um, on the basis i'd been brought in to help them and what did I think I was doing, doing the right thing for the game as a whole? But you were um, right, weren't you? Well, I think subsequently, events events have shown. And you know, interestingly, though, we looked at a lot of American um, ideas and innovations. Um, first thing we did with the TV was to bring Match of the Day back, which had disappeared. Um, so we wanted Match of the Day, and then we were thinking. But that's an interesting one because that that's, that's a BBC institution. Yeah, you're you're talking to Rupert Murdoch and that scenario to build out a broadcast platform that's going to do for the Premier League what it's obviously ultimately done. But we would never have had the Premier League with Sky only. We would never have done that. We needed that terrestrial, terrestrial anchor. Yeah. yeah. But looking at the American sports, we were really taken with the idea of Monday night football. Yep. Expanding the weekend. Really yeah. smart, yeah, worked yeah. brilliant. And and listen, you know, 
we had no qualms about pinching other people's ideas if they were the best ideas are often other people's aren't the they? good ones yeah um and the original concept was we'll have itv on a sunday and we'll have sky on a monday okay S sky at first would have loved that because that would have given them the 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 entry itv's attitude was now nah, we can't do that because we've got to kill satellite we can't do anything that's yeah. going to uh, and by the way comp competition yeah. we will have enough votes we will win yeah and as time unfolded sky got quite irritated with, with by that and they became bolder and they said well i'll tell you what we'll really go for it yeah we will go for broke on this and give murdoch his due mm. and we went to itv numerous times and said what about a joint venture on satellite um satellites coming um you can be a part of it but you know they were buying motorway service stations and diversifying granada yeah 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 murdoch had this laser-like focus and bet the house mm -hmm. on it he absolutely bet yeah. the house on it you know it, he he was probably within hours of he could have gone bust over it mm -hmm. um you know sky were turning over I think it's turning over about 230 million back in 91, losing 180 million, mm. which is pretty chilling. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow said, you know what? All in. We're going to go for this yeah. all in on this Premier League and the battering ram. And as Sam Chisholm, uh, his inimitable first New Zealand um, chief executive hewn out of solid granite said it, Sky and the Premier League was the greatest corporate romance of all time. Where where are the FA in all this? Because I have a major problem with the FA, and I have a major problem with the independent regulator, and the FA is abdicating a responsibility from being the de facto regulator, and we'll talk about that shortly. But in the construction of the Premier League, the FA have an integral part in allowing it to happen, have a voting criteria within the confines of it, but they don't seem to have ever utilised it. It's now we've got a situation where the tail wags the dog, where did the FA subsequently have leverage, have relevance in domestic football to such an extent now where I would make the accusation that they have none? Because the Big Five weren't trusted, we also said, why don't we make it the FA Premier League? That's my point. You take yeah. the lead. Yeah. And we'll bring... I mean, I came in as a complete outsider. And like many, a lifelong football fan, football fanatic, but never understood why we've got a football league and an FA, why we've got one in the north of England, one day, what, what's the point? Why can't we bring it all under one roof? And that was the idea, FA Premier League. Uh, and the first meeting of the clubs, FA called the 22 clubs to a meeting at Lancaster Gate, unveiled the Premier League. It was going to be 18 clubs. Mm -hmm. It was going to be a reduction to help the England team um reduce the clutter of the fixtures and the first question from the floor ironically came from <laughs> the chairman of the international committee who you might have expected to be thinking of the national team's interest but said 18 clubs is that compulsory and if sir bert miller chip had just said yes it is i think we'd have just moved on but this is the first question at the first meeting and Sir Bert says, it's your league, you will decide. And Graham Kelly and I looked at each other and thought, what? Mm. And later in the meeting, uh, we'd kind of gone through the ideas and Ron Node said, it, it's really interesting, but we ought to go away and meet and we'll decide what we want to do. Now, again, if the FA had said, no, 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 this is, this is our show. It's our league. This is what we're doing. Yeah. But it, again, instead of which, Sir Bert, who was a great gentleman, I mean, lovely, lovely person, said, yeah, not a problem. Oh. And and why don't you borrow our council chamber for the meeting? Mm -hmm. um, the clubs are meeting and doing precisely weekly what they want. Yeah. and saying, well, we don't want to be part of the FA because... And there was a valid point that said, well, hang on. Our TV rights, if we're if we're just operating as a committee of the FA, where, where does the money go? I mean, how do we know that we're going to get our fair share? Um, we actually want separate legal personality. We, we should have a separate company. Mm -hmm. And we don't want the FA on the board. 
and I have to go to Graham Kelly and said, yeah, we don't want much to do with you. We don't really want to be in the FA, yeah. um, but you can have a special share yeah. uh, with certain limited voting rights. And the FA agreed. Yeah. Um, you think that was a mistake? I didn't at the time because clearly, you know, I, I was representing the Premier League. The Premier League. Yeah. But for um, the good of the game, it was a mistake. But for it? the good of the game, if the FA had stood firm right at the start, what would the clubs have done? Where would they? Have, they wouldn't have had anywhere else to no, go. Exactly. So, so yeah, I mean, the FA pretty much handed the keys over mm -hmm. at the start. I want to take you to COVID um, <clears throat> and look <throat> at the landscape of football. You and I had a debate on another platform about big picture, mm -hmm. but there was obviously a, a lot of noise around that clubs were going to go to the wall. Did you fear, really fear, rather than save a rattling to make sure that football got attention and there was a proper set of dialogue, did you fear that there was going to be a lot of clubs that would go bust? No. no. Why? Uh, because you didn't have time for fear. I mean, the interesting thing with COVID was there was no manual. No. Uh, and we were making decisions daily. The... I remember the very, very first decision we took with the board, which was a bold one, um, bearing in mind the cash flow of TV deals. Um, you you tend to have quite a lot of money up front. Yeah. And the Football League actually had quite a lot of money sitting in its bank account. Right. So you could advance. And we had a meeting to... and well, I didn't think of it, horrified the executive a little bit at the time. We said, listen, we've got to do something to show that we're actually helping. Mm. How much have we got? Come on, really tell me how much have we absolutely got? And we said, well, we'll give 50 million to clubs. Repayable. Mm. Um, but we need to make a gesture. We need to do something to show that, listen, don't panic. Um, we're trying to control this situation. We're trying to be decisive. We're trying to be On up front foot. when yeah. nobody knew what was happening from one week to the next. So we got money out to clubs and we then had a tough decision to take in terms of Leagues 1 and Leagues 2. Um, and again, this is back to my point of the 72. To have got everybody playing again that first season would have been incredibly challenging. Um, but we had to make sure that Leagues 1 and Leagues 2 didn't become irrelevant or yeah. disappear. Um, so we didn't, and then again, did we, did we just curtail the season and forget about it? Mm -hmm. And we said, no, we can't do that. We, we need them to be relevant. So we're actually going to somehow or other make the playoffs work. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to take a view on the tables as they stand. Mm -hmm. Needed to keep the championship going, um, clearly because at the top, it was really important that we had the three up and three down. And there were moves within the Premier League from some clubs that we won't name to uh, to have no relegation. I which, can imagine, yeah. Which would have been um, pretty catastrophic. Um, we tried to get wage deferrals um, with the PFA, which inevitably was challenging. Um, I mean, I... I... I, I'm more robust than you and you might have to be a bit more political, but I, 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 I'm beyond my level of tolerance with the PFA and what they bring to the game. Yeah, I think I am more tolerant and uh, take a slightly more rounded view um, because we did get quite a lot of deferrals and, you know, there is a point at League One, League Two, these are not wealthy superstars. Mm. These are, you know absolutely solid professionals yeah. who have mortgages to pay bills to pay um they don't have necessarily massive savings so um and they don't know where their next contract is coming from so i think we've got to keep it in balance um and we did get some deferrals and the reality is the clubs did all come through it mm -hmm. how much responsibility did you think, given the government, because we discussed in 2020, why aren't you going getting it 
from the government and why are the arts getting it and why mm. can't you get it? And you said, well, I don't know, you ask the government. Uh, and the reality is the government thinks that the Premier League should be doing something. How much responsibility did you think the Premier League should have for a bailout mentality? Uh, a lot more than they did, for sure. The thing I was most disappointed about, I have to say, was government's response to big picture because that was, for me, the short-term solution because there was 250 million quid available for COVID and the long-term solution. Um, and 250 million was always our ask in terms of the lost gate receipts at EFL level. Um, and of course, gate receipts much more important proportionately at EFL level than they are at Premier League level. But as it turned out, they all survived by hook or by crook. Mm. Owners dug deep through it. I mean, there were ironies with, um, you know, Bristol City, Steve Lansdowne, mm. um, couldn't get money for football, but got money for his rugby club. Mm. And you try explaining that to government and their sort of eyes glazed over and what, we don't understand the difference. Do you think, well, okay. Um, no, I had conversations with Oliver, Dow Oliver Dowden and, and I got that impression that it was just a, a one-dimensional myopic view. The Premier League has so yep. much money, that's the end of the discussion. But when you say the <coughs> Premier League, you felt disappointed the Premier League could have done more. I mean, is there really, in your mindset, this correlation between what Sheikh Mansur at Man City thinks he should do for Del Vince at Forest Green Rovers? Well, this goes back to where we were a, a while ago in terms of the fabric of English football mm. and its relevance and its importance and should the Premier League be doing more. Now, you could mount an argument that actually it's two separate leagues and each should look after its own interests. Yep. And I wouldn't agree, but I could understand I that can understand argument. that argument as well, yeah. And if you look at where we were in 92-93, first year of the Premier League, turnover of the Premier League itself, not all the clubs, but the Premier League Limited, which was the TV deal, basically. Turnover of the Premier League was 45 million. Turnover of the EFL was 34 million. That's a gap of 11 million. Mm. And the EFL's turnover is 75% of the Premier Leagues. So, you know, that's bridgeable, that's doable. The gap now is three billion. The EFL's turnover is 6% of the Premier League's level, and yet we're still supposed to be operating mm -hmm. a pyramid. It's too much of a chasm. And if the Premier League were to argue, you know, the Steve Parrish argument, well, supermarkets don't subsidize the corner shop. Okay, but then the Premier League completely and utterly undermines that argument by paying parachute payments to a selected group. Yeah, and also the whole structure of football being held together by collective bargaining and all yeah. that sort of stuff. So you can't have it both ways. And I thought it was a poor example. And I also thought it was a poor example when Christian Perslow came on, on a show and turned <coughs> around and said, when I was putting it to him that the Premier League should do more, and he said, we are doing more, we're doing this, that, and the other, we're putting 1.5 billion down. Well, that's nonsense because most of those, but that is parachute payments. But also, also, you're suggesting that you've arranged a 250 million pound loan well, wonderful. That's fantastic of you. What the fucking hell is that going to do for anybody? A two hundred and fifty million million pound loan is not you really helping doing anything, is it? A two hundred and fifty million pound gift yeah, is yeah. you helping something. A two hundred and fifty million pound loan is laughable. The parachute payment argument I, that you have, and you're quite robust on it, and I'm I'm I can understand why you are, but I also I don't agree with it because I I, I think parachute payments being paid to clubs to give them an opportunity to get into the Premier League, compete in the Premier League, not damage themselves behind, beyond irreparable harm economically by trying to stay there, at the same time as not diminishing the core product, which is the value of the Premier League in all its parts, has to be underpinned by some form of safety net. If you look at the Championship, 75% of the money that comes from the Premier League goes to the parachute clubs right and let's look at the turnover of the championship clubs in 2020 21 so the average turnover of the non-parachute clubs is 20 million 14 million is it 14 million right 
the average turnover of the parachute clubs is 50 million. Mm -hmm. It's three times. But what's the average wage bill? Yeah, but <laughs> it's chicken and egg, isn't it? Because it's the income that gives you the ability to fund the wage bill, which then makes you more competitive. I mean, the, the reality is six teams have been in the Premier League forever. Yeah. 14, you know, the other 14 come and go. Luton became the 51st club um, to play in the Premier League. So there have been three clubs for every one place in the Premier League. 20 clubs in the championship at the moment have Premier League experience, so that there is that interchange. The 14 clubs who are not in the top six are going to be back with us relatively soon, statistically. They're all going to be back in the EFL. But if you take a snapshot at the moment, the 14 non-top six clubs are sharing 1.9 billion of TV income yep. from yep. the Premier League. Yep. The 19 non-parachute clubs in the championship are sharing uh, 170 million. Yep. Less than 10%. Yeah, yeah. I, but, I would argue, I can't prove it, but nobody has disproved it. And no, nobody's actually said you're talking complete rubbish. You, you might, and we might disagree on it. I would actually say that you could take 14 clubs from the championship, swap them with the 14 in the Premier League, and there'd be no diminution in the Premier League's TV deal value because it's the big clubs that drive the value. Parachute payments in 2010-11 totaled 30 million quid. Mm -hmm. In less than 10 years, by 2018-19, they were 265 million. Yeah. Wages over that period doubled. They're not parachute payments, they're trampoline payments. They're not there to fend off financial disaster. They are there to enable clubs to get straight back up. Let, let's just be pretty clear about that. And, the, and they work. And I think they're completely perverse because what the Premier League says is, when you come up, we need you to be able to compete. Well, if the cliff edge wasn't so big in the first place, which and I think you touched on this. Yeah. It would be an awful lot easier for them to compete when they went up. And then he wouldn't face financial catastrophe when they came down. Fine, but there's no appetite for the parachute payment argument whatsoever. So we're sort of whistling in the wind. What the argument now <clears> is about is about distribution and the overall distribution situation. And then underpinning governance. Because ultimately it's all well and good having distributions yeah. that are greater. If they're still able to, football club owners, to do precisely what they want. Yeah how they want yep. without any kind of covenant over the top of them to make them operate properly as sustainable businesses because yep. I find mm -hmm. the football industry remarkably immature in the idea that the governance is how much money you're allowed to lose. Correct. Most industries would look at that and go, well, that's absurd. Yeah. You've got to be sustainable. You can't be independent. You've got to be independent. A business should run over its own cash flows. And and every now and again, if there's capital expenditure that needs to be invested in the business for legitimate reasons, then an owner can step mm -hmm. in and do that. Stadium rebuilds academy developments, whatever else. Where are you on the political side of things in terms of I'm very much against sport being leveraged, yet football seem to embrace it with open arms. Let's let's campaign for this call. Let's everybody do this. Let's everybody do that. And now it's walked itself backwards into a bleeding conundrum. But where are you on football being leveraged for causes? Because I think football was purpose-built for entertainment, was for escapism. And why does it want to get itself involved in causes? Yeah, I think we've got a... I mean, I think the time has absolutely come where we've just got to think it through yeah. properly. I, you know, and in a sense, it started with the poppy campaign. Mm -hmm. um, we'd managed for 100 years without poppies being, and listen, I'm a massive supporter of the poppy campaign. Me too. And, and I you think it's a slightly not argue against it. But why do they have to be on football shirts yeah. all of a sudden when they hadn't been for 100 years? Um, and it's almost it's it's the hardest word to say it had in, to be, the hardest it? word to say in football as you well know in many environments no. is no yeah. the convenient one is well yes okay we'll we'll allow that to happen and it's the path of least resistance and things go too far and yeah. then you have to sit down and say well you know somebody once said to me it was Brian Wolfson um you know, when he was running Wembley, came up. He was great one-liners, Brian, and this is way back in the early days of the Premier League. 
and he came up with a great line. He said, the trouble with football is you, you measure progress with a pendulum rather than a barometer. <laughs> okay. It's one extreme yeah, or the other. other. Yeah. It's never a progression. And, and that's always stuck with me. And and somebody else once said, you know, the football's a bit like a drunken man. It knows it's had too much to drink because it falls over. Mm. Uh, but it doesn't sort of anticipate. And, and suddenly they then have to, you know, sit down and say, well, this has gone too far. So maybe we now have to retrench and start all over again, as opposed to thinking through the consequences a little bit mm. earlier. Well, given the fact you've said almost a Shankleyism, transcending life, football is you know, much more important than life and death. Let's talk about Liverpool to finish off this conversation between you and I. Obviously, Liverpool is, a, is, a, is one of the most iconic football clubs in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you, you were in there as the CEO from 98 to 2010. Um, talk to me about your experiences with Liverpool, um, what it's like being the CEO of undoubtedly one of the most iconic clubs in, in <clears throat> English football, and I think in world football, with all the legacy, going back to Shankly and the great players that passed through the door, and obviously the Moores family owning it, and all of these challenges, and obviously in your world, Hicks and Gillette. Mm -hmm. So walk me through it. I mean, wouldn't have missed it for the world. You're clearly. Liverpool fan, right? Yeah, Liverpool fan, which... Again, it magnifies everything. So the highs are higher and the lows are lower. Yeah. And there's never anything in between. Mm -hmm. There are no shades of gray. Um, certainly not in the fans' minds. Everything's binary. Everything's black or everything's yeah. white. Um, you're not allowed to paint in shades of gray. Um, so we had some wonderful highs. We had some terrible lows. Um, it's definitely not easy. Uh, but then, you know, why, why would you take on something that's easy? Um, you, you have this enormous sense of responsibility in trying to do things the, you know, the right way and the Liverpool way and understanding what that means. Um, most of it I loved. Um, obviously, massively regret that we didn't win the Premier League. Of course. Um, came close twice, but... European Cup in there. And we should have won it in 2009. Yeah, I mean, European Cup was, I mean, it was mad. It was just astonishing that we won that yeah. with the team that we had. Um, actually, for me, 2001 was more enjoyable, the treble. Right, that was Julio, right? Julio, because we yeah. kicked off with the League Cup in February. And it is brilliant winning a cup in February because... Mm -hmm the celebration kind of starts yeah. and it builds. And then we had that insane final week um, where we won the, you know, we won the FA Cup um, against the odds. I mean, Art Arsenal battered us, mm. um, played us off the park and Michael Owens, two late goals. And then three days later, we're off in Dortmund. We should have battered Alaves, but the, the, the team were dead on their feet. and. So somehow we end up with a silver goal. I mean, we were brilliant value for finals because we yeah. never won a final easily. Um, and then we have to go to Charlton on the final day to get into the Champions League and first half Charlton are battering us. And because again, we just run out of legs, run out of gas and that second half, Robbie Fowler came good and we win four nil. So that, six months was just there's so many memories building on each other and beating barcelona in uh, in the um uefa cup and beating roma and beating everton in the most dramatic circumstances it was just it was just amazing whereas istanbul was kind of i mean a stunning game but so much kind of against the odds that we got there in the first place that you almost didn't take it in it was just it was almost just yeah just unreal but but fabulous um but yeah i mean it, it was um and it was harder than running a premier league i mean running a top club is i was gonna ask difficult. you that because i i have a mixed emotions of uh, being an owner mm -hmm. you know i i made a lot of money <clears throat> i ended up running out of it in the biggest banking crisis that took me down and put me in a big position i ended up writing it all off and letting people like parish make a lot of money off my deeds that's the way the world goes i've accepted my medicine but i did have of a dim view of chief executives in football. I felt that they most of the time got jobs in certain spaces because they because they were 
in some, somehow in, involved in the football world. I likened them to people that were, actually weren't capable of running news agents. And I also felt that they were in a very difficult role because they, they, they were divested of all the authority because they didn't have control of the money. The money controls things. But in your, in your instance and in instances, because you're, you're a grown up in this conversation and in most conversations, we might disagree ideologically and, th and philosophically about things, but we're, there's a conversation to be had with someone you, like you mm -hmm. and I can learn a mm -hmm. lot from it. I didn't think I learned a lot from many of the chief executives I encountered. And I'm seeing the quality of chief executives really raise now. I see people like Paul Barber and these are proper chief executives that understand the responsibility. They're very fortunate to get to work for very decent owners like Tony Bloom that are very committed. But what do you think in football terms makes a very good chief executive? Well, I was fortunate in having a wonderful owner in David Moores. You, you couldn't... I didn't like him very much, by the way. I, I liked him I a lot. Li I didn't like being given a... I didn't like being given a pendant by David Moores in the boardroom at Liverpool in the 2001 League Cup semi-final saying, this is what we give to all the small clubs when they come here. I didn't much like that, Rick. I didn't enjoy that. Well, okay. I have a different view of David because David was a brilliant chairman to work for, yep. cared passionately about the club, put the club way in front of his own interests, yep. uh, lifelong fan, um, completely supportive. You know, I've talked about purpose uh, being really important. and it, it, it sounds like a statement of the obvious, but often stating the obvious frequently helps. Our purpose at Liverpool was winning trophies. Yeah. Uh, and we hadn't won any for quite a long time. Um, and Gerard bought into that completely. So um, if you look at the first season, I was involved with Gerard, 2000, 2001. Obviously, getting into the Champions League mattered. But the start of the season, we sat down with the players at the training camp and said, going to talk purpose. We're going to talk about what we're all here for. We're going to talk about winning silverware. So and that then comes down to team selection in the cup competitions and mm. and the priorities and 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 not using the league cup as an opportunity to field the youth team. Um, always a tricky balance, but you know. But as a chief executive, you'd have not much jurisdiction in that area, though, would you? Getting the dynamics right in football. If you've got the manager, the chief executive, and the owner, stroke chairman, all on the same page Aligned, and yeah. pulling in the same direction, yeah. you've got a, you've really, got good chance, a yeah. really good chance. Yeah which then kind of contrasting that with how we any achi ever achieved anything with Hicks and Gillette is... Well, that's is, my question next, yeah. ...is one of life's great mysteries. So having everybody aligned in what we're trying to achieve, massively important. Um, but how said, quickly into their involvement did you think... Christ, what have I got here? Uh, the day before they took over. <laughs> okay. The day before they took over because we uh, we had a press conference to announce it um we'd known george for quite a long time um david actually got to quite like george uh he was a decent fella very likable um we'd been over to see his ice hockey team uh, and he just gave us free reign he literally gave us the keys and said just wander around talk to anybody and, and that was quite commendable um and then he brought tom hicks in literally a week before so we did we hadn't met tom we didn't really know tom they had done business together um, they've been in meat packing together. And again, this is classic of you can happily survive together in many businesses, but football yeah. is something special. Yeah. So we have the, we're planning for the press conference to announce the deal. And we have a very professional PR advisor who was teeing the whole thing up. Uh, and it's a big announcement, massive announcement for Liverpool, the Moores family. So it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's huge. It's, you know, it is an icon. It has to be done properly. So we're kind of doing the briefing on don't ever call them the Liverpool Reds. Don't mention franchise, you know, all the things you have to do yeah, with them. Yeah. Um, all the missteps the Americans could make. The Americans yeah. might make. Yeah. And they said, right, running order, probably best if Rick starts because he can explain why the club came to the position uh, of needing to sell. No problem with that. And George, you should go second because you've been around for six months. And Tom Hicks said, I'm going second. If he goes first, I'll never get a word in Edwidge. <laughs> okay. And I'm th honestly at that point, what I'm thinking, yeah. what are we doing here? What is going on here? Because mm -hmm. this just 
and you know when your first instincts yeah, you are negative, yeah, yeah. it's generally right. They're not always right when they're positive, but when they're negative, and you, and back to that need for togetherness, they were 50-50, absolute 50-50. There were no deadlock provisions, and you know, which is ridiculous, isn't it? It was rushed. They put it together quickly. Yeah, with hindsight, well, even with foresight, it was ridiculous. We didn't know that at the time, but that that was the source of many, many challenges later. Mm. You lead me into Rafa. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I have to say, uh, I'm not an admirer. Uh, I think he's one of the most divisive football managers around. Um, you had explicit experience of him, and I think challenges with him. We had some really good times. Yeah. Um, or 2000. Five, 2005 yeah. I mean absolutely so he's you know he's got a place in Liverpool's history um did brilliantly and uh, as a coach you know if you if, if you wanted to hire somebody to set up a team to win a particular game he's as good as would get. be right up there yeah um absolutely gets it and I think Rafa would acknowledge um, perhaps grudgingly, I think he would acknowledge that with the Moores family, he actually had something quite special. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a be careful what you wish for. I think with Rafa, it was we need new investment. We want to be competing. We want to win. And we all wanted to win. Um, and, you know, he did, he did to an extent play one owner off against the other, backfired on him because he got fired a year in, which was. I mean, just bizarre. Hadn't backed him properly in the transfer market. Um, I, I think Rafa, in the right environment and with the right structure, with an owner and chief executive and him aligned, is yeah. great. But isn't alignment with Rafa Benitez defined by him? No, not no. I think if if there's a chink, if there's a weakness... He'll exploit it. He may try to exploit it. I think if the boundaries are clear... Yeah then in his lane he's fine and yeah. th the thing i would never never challenge rafa on was his passion was all about success yeah. and winning and we were completely and utterly aligned on that what did you make of his i mean that people paraphrase it as his iconic rant about facts and sir alex ferguson you're sitting as chief executive are you going what 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 or, or are you going you know Fill your boots, Rafa, if you want to. No, 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 me. And and it's quite interesting because we were playing away at Stoke in a uh, in a morning game. And if we'd won, we'd have gone top. We'd have gone ahead of United again. Rafa had actually been um, off sick over Christmas with um, had a very painful kidney stone. And we'd actually done really well. Sammy Lee took temporary right. charge, and we battered Bolton at home. We'd gone up and won four at Newcastle. And then Rafa came back. And again, we were playing early. Uh, Dirk Kite did an interview the other day and it was kind of brought back memories that season that we always seemed to play early. United played late. And when we got on the plane to travel home, they'd be losing. And when we got off it, they'd have got an 89th minute winner. So suddenly they'd leapfrog. But that that game at Stoke was all about opportunity for us to get three points and, and we drew nil nil terrible game uh, and it was quite interesting that some of the leading players are thinking why is it about him this should be about the team yeah and big occasion for us or do it after the game yeah you know do it yeah when we've actually built something and yeah. achieved something but piling that pressure on what what is the point why do you think he did it oh i have no idea no I have no idea because he didn't tell us in advance, which would be typical Rafa. And there wasn't a lot of point in saying, what did you do that for? Because the moment has, has gone. And, you know, as we'd seen with Kevin Keegan years before, what would the reaction be from Fergie? He'd have fallen about laughing yeah. and thought, got you. Got you. Yeah. When you look at Liverpool now under FSG and with Klopp, who, are, by mm -hmm. the way, I think is a, a fabulous manager. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on it? I think they've done brilliantly. Yeah. Um, in the, the European Cup win was was terrific. And um, and I think the owners have done it. They've definitely done it with a sustainable model. Mm -hmm. 
They are absolutely about, they don't want to lose money. Um, they're not in it to make profit. They're in it to build long-term value. They're in it to win. I think they're, honestly, I think they're really, really good owners. And listen, the, the fans give them stick because the fans want to be competing with, mm. with Man City and the sovereign states. Um, but the owners have had that patience and the courage to say, if it's going to take longer, it will take, it will take longer. And, you know, it took them a few years to get the measure of it. But I think the fact that they were not Hicks and Gillette yeah. gave them a lot of credit in the bank with the yeah. fans yeah. and they were much more patient. And the other thing that's, um, I'm not making excuses in any way, shape or form. It's just, again, a statement of fact. What we lived through was the fan base who were used to Liverpool winning titles. Of course, yeah. So it was always that expectation. It's now three years, it's four years, it's five years. It was so long that for a lot of Liverpool fans, the younger fans, the attendees, they'd never, they'd seen, never seen Liverpool yeah. win a title. Yeah. So you didn't quite have that. So I think they got, not an easy ride, because Liverpool fans are demanding, but they got that degree of patience, mm. tolerance. Baked in now. Baked in. and But th listen, they get criticised by the fans yeah. now, which you know I just think is... Short-sighted. And we know that Short fans memories. are short-sighted, yeah. yeah. demanding, yeah. but it... It is, and is it just the minority on but social media? A lot but... of it's, me it's social media, isn't it? A lot of it's media. I mean, we both know, you and I, for whatever reason, <clears> and I, I occupy some space in the media, but on my terms, so I don't play the game that the media does. It's divisive. It creates yeah, yeah. division and misrepresents, and most of the time it's vacuous, uninformed opinions, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that's what they need to be pushed back on. Well, e even with Hicks and Gillette, one, one of the local patch journalists from one of the national titles used to say, 500 people have marched against Hicks and Gillette. 45,000 yeah. people actually haven't. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's the marches, it's the noise that grab. Well, you the, know that. The headlines. It's the vociferous and, minority yeah, yeah. in every walk of life. Last question. Mm -hmm. As we sit here today, as the chair of the EFL, how confident are you that the things that you're put, you put in place and the things that you will put in place? are going to lead to a, a, a far more positive future for 72 valuable <clears throat> football clubs? Um, I don't think it's the things I've put in place. I think it's the things that... Well, you're the clubs, chair. Yeah. It's but, you're the chair. Yeah, but... You can you, be self-effacing if you want. You, you are the chair. It, the credit will go to the clubs for taking the big decisions and the right decisions. But um, I've sat in a room, Rick, with 72 other clubs, and I know what it takes to lead. From the from the EFL, I've been remarkably critical over the years. I was remarkably critical of Keith Harris and David Burns, God rest his soul, because I thought they were useless. I was critical of other people. I didn't think Sean Harvey was up to the job. I admired Brian Mulwinney at times because he was a politician. He could negotiate his way through certain things, but I didn't think he did a great job with solidarity. But you also, at the solidarity payments and what <clears> they gave away in exchange for that, and the short-sightedness of people's mindsets from lower divisions. But you are on the cusp of an opportunity to create a a, a, a a change in the way that football clubs operate in the in the EFL, proper disciplines in place, proper opportunity to finance, and then they've got no excuse. Mm -hmm. Is that how you see it? Yeah, yeah, and I think we'll get there. Uh, but I believe in the owners, and I believe in their commitment. And as I said, we, you know, the last three weeks, and I, and I could show you correspondence from clubs saying very, very clearly, and we put out a statement to clubs following the last board meeting, that we're absolutely committed to making sure that new funding goes into making the clubs sustainable yeah. and reduces that owner funding commitment. There's a there's a, a massive dose of realism, people doing the right thing. We've got, I mean, listen, we've got a few owners that are challenging, a few yeah. clubs that are challenging, but we've got some fabulous owners across the piece. I mean brilliant and you know that they deserve they deserve a great future because of the effort yeah. they put in and the commitment they make i think that's right anyway listen during the course of this conversation you and i have agreed to disagree on a few things but i've enjoyed it and i'm very much grateful for you being so upfront with me thank, thank you. you upfront with me simon jordan is brought to you by william hill future episodes can be found on youtube spotify or wherever you find your podcasts 18 plus Please gamble responsibly.